Hey folks, Steve here with a Pax Romana Greco-Persian War video for you today. In this video, we'll be looking at turn one, and I think that will be as much as we can get done if we're even that lucky. Um, so a couple of things I want to talk about that I didn't want to put into the introduction just because it's a lot more to talk about and a lot more depth, and um, I think it just makes more sense to talk about it here that, you know, we've done the setup here, um, and if you're at, in any way familiar with the existing rules, um, I guess what I want to spend a little bit of time before actually starting to play is talk about the special rules so that if I'm playing and you're thinking, well, why didn't Steve do this or why shouldn't we be doing some other thing? Well, um, there are some special rules that govern the game uh, because of the scenario. So. Um, I talked a little bit about some of them before. There's some map restrictions. So most of Gaul is out of play. Germania, Germania is out of play. Most of Italy is out of play. The uh, port spaces can be used to move uh, navally. So, you, so those are technically in play. Um, but for the most part, otherwise they are not. Or at least the, the players cannot enter these hexes. Um, and I think I should probably put some on these mountain passes, but I'm not going to worry so much about it right now. Um, so we kind of talked about that already. Uh, the other stuff that's going on, there's certain event cards that have been removed from the deck. Uh, Alexander the Great makes a grand appearance in this game. Um, and the Greek player will get both the Conqueror card and Alexander. Uh on, I think it's turn 9, I want to say. I'm going to have to double-check that, but I believe it's uh, turn 9. So he's a very good leader. That, that's like the best ratings you can get on a leader. Alexander's obviously quite good. Um, so then you have uh, some of the more specific uh, special rules. So all of this is in the C3I magazine. Um, so you have these Quarreling Greeks, Imperial Overreach, and Carthaginian Council... Um, it, it's just stuff that impacts how many activation markers you get and impacts your income a little bit. If you're too big, that can cause some quarreling amongst the Greeks because of divergent interests. Same thing, Imperial Overreach and the Carthaginian Council of Elders, uh, or uh, the families and how that's organized. If there's just some friction there, it's not a huge deal. It's, it, it's not a mechanic that's that different from what's in the base game for many things. Uh, special rule number two is changes to raising units, the Greek hoplites. So this is something I didn't really talk about um, much. If you really want to stop and read all of that, you know, hit pause and read it. I'm not going to keep it on camera too long. Um, the way that the game works, and I should have covered this in the introduction video, is that Pax Romana features a really interesting uh, manpower and unit type system where I think I had mentioned there's light infantry, there's heavy infantry, there's cavalry, there are elephants. Well, where you get those units actually uh, matters. On the map, these different territories, these different regions, the Danube, uh, Italy, you know, the Rome area, Carthage, you know, the Africa area, all these territories uh, ultimately have uh, a, little, a little notation here that tells you what kind of units you can build. So in Carthage, uh, the Carthage territory, as a for instance, um, you could build heavy infantry, uh, light infantry, cav, and elephants. So you can get a broad set of units. Um, Rome, the Rome region, is uh, heavy infantry and legions, if you're, if you're Rome, um, and so, uh, and then Gaul is light infantry and cab only in the base game, in the regular scenario. Um, so if you think about that for a second, right, that means that Rome, in a normal game, on a normal scenario that covers the base, you know, turns and time frame, Rome can build heavy infantry, you know, their legions, basically, um, in their home territory. But if they wanted to go get uh, some light infantry they'd have to control some parts of the Sicilies to get light infantry. There's a light infantry notation right here. If they wanted Cav, they'd have to go to Gaul. Now, um, or, or Germania, I guess. 
Um, and, and that sort of makes sense, right? If you if you understand sort of the uh, allied cavalry situation now, you know, obviously even before the Romans used allied cavalry, they they had their own ecotes that, you know, maybe weren't as good. And so the game, you know, it, the game abstracts some of this, but like, hey, if you want to have some good cavalry, you're going to go elsewhere for it. Uh, Roman legions, just as a side note, do have a special rule where if you have multiple legions, you get some cavalry presence embedded in the legion, but that's a bunch of special rule stuff we're not going to worry about right now. <laughs> the point is, where you control and actually going somewhere on the map, not just for its economic purposes or its victory points or whatever, but because it may enable you to recruit units that you wouldn't normally be able to recruit in some of your areas that you start with, and you do want a good composite, different composition of forces to have cavalry advantages, um, to to take hits off of light infantry because they're cheaper, and all that kind of stuff. Like there's there's a whole different set of things to uh, to worry about there. Um, so uh, you know, with that, the special rule that I had on screen is referencing the fact that in this time period before the base game Pax Romana situation, um, the Greek hop, hoplites uh, were, you know, or hoplites, depending on how you, you choose to pronounce that, um, were the Greek heavy infantry. They were the, you know, specialized forces of the time period that beat out a lot of uh, other other forces that were light, more lightly armed. They were just not as heavily armed as the hoplites in many cases. And so the special rule here is that uh, only the Greek player can raise heavy infantry normally. Um, the East player, meaning Carthage and, and the Persian Empire, uh, can raise um, can raise heavy infantry via elite units and mercenaries. And so mercenaries are a whole subsystem in the game where um, you have like these green units that are I'm not going to get that to focus, but I won't worry about it. You can. There are ways for those factions to get mercenaries, and there are some heavy infantry included in those mercenaries. So that's basically saying the Persians, the Carthaginians hire uh, some some folks to be uh, hev heavily armored troops or heavy heavy troops. Um, uh, heavy infantry cannot be raised by uh, either player in the Danube or Asia Minor which normally you would be able to recruit heavy infantry according to the map notation, but uh, in this time period, they're, they're just not available. You can't do it. Um, and in any province where heavy infantry could be raised, the East player can raise only light infantry instead. So even in Carthage, the area of Carthage, um, they, they can't get heavy infantry. So that, that's just a very basic, straightforward rule that the, uh, the Greek player, while maybe outnumbered uh, in terms of like two powers versus one, or however you want to look at it, will have the heavy infantry advantage tactically. Um, and then there's a manpower adjustment chart that governs this where even if the Eastern player does a lot to try to get heavy infantry um, via the methods that are available, they, they have a much smaller limit to how many uh, they can have before it becomes very costly. So that modified chart is here. We can see heavy infantry units allowed before maintenance, so extra maintenance costs. Um, this is based on your stability. Obviously, the Greeks have a much greater advantage over the East player for this purpose. Um, there are some elite units. So there are uh, these elite units are basically uh, units of their type, but they're just a little bit better. They have a little bit more combat power. There are Persian Immortals, which are elite light infantry that the Persian player starts with. Uh, there are Spartans, which are elite heavy infantry that the Greek player starts with. There's the Athenians, which is an elite uh, galley squadron or, or you know, naval unit, which, because it came in C3I, is a different size counter than the rest of the big uh, counters. Um, but uh, we just watch out for that. They're a little bit better. Athenian... Uh, galley squadron. Um, the Carthaginians will eventually get the sacred band, elite heavy infantry, but not until turn seven. The Argi, uh, man, I'm gonna have a hard time saying this. Argiasathides. 
Um, I'm sure I butchered that. It's the Macedonian Elite Heavy Infantry. Um, they're available in Pella on turn 8. The Companion Elite Cavalry for the Macedonians uh, that the Greek player gets access to also in Pella on turn 8. Um, and then uh, if you lose any of these elite units, if they're just defeated uh, wholly and are removed from the game, that owning player suffers a minus one to their stability level, so you got to watch out, some risk and reward. In regards to elephants, no elephants can be raised in this scenario. So again, there are some places on the map, Carthage, elsewhere, that have elephants listed as a unit type. Um, they, do, they cannot be raised. Uh, but on turn 9, the East player receives one Elephant unit for free in Antioch or the nearest controlled space. So, um, the Elephant unit I put up there for that purpose. Now, there's going to be something that um, you, you're going to... I should just get this out of the way now because I'm sure someone's going to someone's gonna mention it. Um, yes, on the map, and I'll adjust the camera a little bit so you can see a little bit better. There is a city that is Antioch. There is a city that is Alexandria. Um, correct, in this time frame that this scenario portrays, these, these cities do not exist. Alexandria is not a city, because it can't be named after Alexander yet. He hasn't been born. Antioch cannot be a city. It does not exist. Um, what you need to sort of just accept is that they're using this space on the map that happens to have that name as a stand-in. So, um... You know, whether, you know, you could, you could, because these circles, these spots on the map really are like pretty large areas. It, it's just some other city. We're going to call it Antioch because that's what the map says. It's not really Antioch because Antioch doesn't exist. Same thing with Alexandria. Doesn't really, doesn't technically exist. But this space on the map exists and we're going to use it for game purposes. We'll call it Alexandria. We'll call it Antioch. Obviously they don't exist yet. Okay, just get, I'm going to get that out of the way now. You, you just get over it. <laughs> just get over it. They they could have, like, you know, you put a little marker that says not Alexandria, but what's the point, right? So we're, we're going to work within the framework of the game and, and enjoy the game. Um, there are some changes to the invasion and rebellion tables. So what types of invasions and where they come from and what sorts of rebellions occur have been modified um, in part because some parts of the map are out of play, so they don't you know, they're obviously going to, you know, if you rolled those results, it would be weird because you couldn't do it. So they, they provided modified charts to better fit the time period. Um, and then uh, they have a slight mo modified special rule for civil wars. Civil wars are a thing that can happen. They're not these huge affairs. They're usually just um, causing widespread losses to your faction and areas of control that you have um, and some other goofy stuff. Basically, the, the special rule here just modifies the threshold for how you get to a civil war, and we probably won't need to worry about it for a while, so I, I won't go into depth until it matters. Um, then we already know, I mentioned before, Egypt is a separate power, uh, and then how Rome and the Italian peninsula uh, affect the game do have some special rules around it. So for turns one through five of this scenario... Etruria is allied with the East against the Greeks. They have, and we use Roman counters to represent them for now, they have a galley squadron here in Sardinia that can be moved by an Eastern leader, whether that's a Carthaginian leader or, or uh, an East. I'm not, I'm not sure it matters. I guess that would mean it's a, the, the Carthaginians could use it. Um, so... Uh, that's for turn one. It's just an extra galley squadron. But on turns two through four, we do put an activation marker in the chit for chit pool, a Roman one. And when it comes up on turn two, basically a, a quote-unquote, you know, Roman army. It's really an Etruscan army. Um, uh, uh, there's a, it's a heavy infantry, light in, two light infantry. A cav and a leader appears at Capua, which is right here, which is technically an out-of-bounds spot on the map, but they just they come in there, they can activate, they can try to fight the Greeks, which means the Greeks have to defend the Tarentum area, Brutium. Um, and then uh, on future turns, similar stuff happens, and then after turn five, not a lot goes on because 
Italy is now in the midst of wars where Rome is trying to gain supremacy. Um, and then, you know, so there's a gap, turn six, seven, and eight, basically quiet and, you know, for the Greeks, because Italy's got its own stuff going on. But on turns nine and ten, Rome becomes available to ally with either player. Um, and so, uh, you know, you pull the Rome activation marker from the pool, and they get some units, and somebody's going to get to use them against the other player. So it's, at the beginning, it's not great for the Greek player. Um, later on in the game, the late stages of the game, it could kind of go either way. Might give the Greek player some relief at that point. Um, there are uh, rules for Babylon Booty Call, which is a mechanic that, you know, whenever there's an Eastern player, it's acknowledging that right off map is a whole empire, potentially, of stuff going on. And there's just a random die roll that affects, you know, is it prof is the rest of the empire profitable? Is it a big money sink? Um, you roll for that. There's historical leaders, which I am, go it's an optional rule, I am going to do it. So each of the leaders that will come onto the board each turn will be predetermined. Their values are predetermined, and, and I just think that'll be more fun. I, yeah, I don't need that extra randomness. Um, and then the rest of the special rules just govern how Egypt uh, gets involved, if it goes uh, on the attack itself, or uh, will it revolt if it gets conquered by the East, uh, which the Eastern player probably would like to capture Egypt. And would like to capture Serenaka for various reasons, but um, ultimately, uh, you know, the East can still the, the Egypt Egypt power can still do stuff. Basically, that that's what those rules boil down to. So, um, okay, so fifteen minutes talking about the special rules, but I wanted to make sure that you guys could see that and, and understand it because I do think um, a lot of that really matters. Uh, if you're already familiar with the game. If you're not familiar with the game, then a lot of what I just said might not really, like, it's good to point out so that you understand, but, you know, not, not super critically important. I think the big thing to know is that recruitment system, where you can get different types of units and the, con the constraint that the whole board is under where only, the, you know, only the Greeks have ready, easy access to, uh, to heavy infantry and it, they're only going to be able to, to call it up in Brutium and the rest of Greece, uh, basically, is the way that works. So, um, okay, let me put a cut here, and there might be a couple more things I would just want to point out before we get get going in the game. Okay, there is something I wanted to point out um, in terms of how to play the game. Obviously, you know what matters is how you win, right? Um, sort of mentioned this a little bit, I think, in the last video, but there's there's a couple ways that we're going to win this scenario as either side. One is the automatic victory, which we can imagine it's kind of an extreme situation that I, I'm really not expecting to see or, you know, I, I just I just doubt that we'll end up seeing it happen, which would be one side or the other just completely conquering and dominating that power into submission, destroying it, right? This would be like Carthage taking over all of this and the East, uh, Persia taking over all of this, and then that's just, that's just the end of the game, basically, right? The, uh, the C3I article describes, you know, what, what is needed there. I'm not going to go into depth of that. If, if it's actually in danger of happening, we'll maybe even stop the game at that point because you know, we probably already know who's going to win. Um, otherwise, it's with victory points. Now, there's a track where you track victory points from turn to turn. You want to have more at the end of the 10-turn grand campaign scenario. Um, and so each turn you will gain victory points. Now, what matters is during each turn, you're going to be comparing the player's values for civilization points and uh, geographic objective points, GOP, um, not the elephant kind. So the, this is, uh, so over here on the player charts, there's a marker for civ points, there's a marker for GOP points. I have set these to what I think the current situation would be if we were to adjudicate victory uh, point it's during the victory point phase at the end of turn one, what would it be? And so the way that this works, and this is on one of the player aid sheets, um, it's a little wonky and sometimes hard to understand. So there's, you, you have GOPs, you have CVPs, civilization value points, um, or CIV points, however you want to look at it. 
Um, and so it does show you, and there's some errata here that I marked off in pen, but ordinarily it's seven victory points for the player with the most geographic objective points. The person with a second only gets four. Uh, if you're playing with, you know, three or four players, then all of these things sort of matter. And then we're also looking at civ points. The game by default tends to value geographic points more than civ points. Um, and so, you know, if you're trying to make a decision, are you playing wide versus tall? Um, the game does seem to want to indicate that playing wider is better, but then wider might also be harder. Now, uh, the game, this scenario does modify the adjustment. So uh, the way it's situated is if you have more geographic objective points, then you're going to get three victory points. Your opponent will get none. Um, and the same thing for CVP, the player with the most civilization points will get two victory points. The other player will get none. So if, you know, one player is playing tall and they have more cities and towns and whatnot, they're going to get two victory points. The player with the more areas controlled will get three victory points so that they will edge the other player out a little bit. So you can't, you can't just pick, you know, if you're going to pick one, I guess you pick GOP, but the, the, CVP is, is going to be important to still accrue no matter what. And the thing is, if you have a tie, um, then no points are awarded. So if I did my counting right, and it's entirely possible that I did not, <laughs> I mean, I'll double check at the end of turn one because stuff's going to change. But I believe that both players have an equal number of civilization points. Um, the East player has more cities but fewer towns, and the Greeks have one city and many more towns, and when you count up all the numbers, cities count for three, towns count for one. I believe both factions, and this is a combination of the Carthaginian and the East yellow markers for the Persian player, however, you know, the non-Greek player, they have 11 SIF points. The Greeks have 11 SIF points, if I counted right. Again, entirely possible I did not. For GOP, the, the geographic objective points, I believe the Greeks have 14 and the East player has 16, again, combining the yellow and the purple, since they're all one faction in this scenario. So right now, the Eastern player is technically ahead on GOP, so they would get three victory points, and then nobody would get any victory points for civilization. So right now, the Eastern player, I think, is advantaged, and they're ahead, right? I guess that's, the, that's how I see the game situation, um, if I'm playing this correct. There's some oddness where you have to look and figure out, like, you know, do you count, uh, do you count Crete and Rhodes and the the Cher Cherisonese? Cher I'm not going to say it right. Gosh, gosh darn it! Once we start getting into Greek, I'm not good at Greek either, guys. Um, the Cherisonese. Uh, you know, these are all single province territories, and you don't get double points for controlling them. You just get the one GOP point for the whole thing of it. Because you would normally, it, it, this is stated at the beginning of the rule book. It's not stated as clear in other parts of the rules, but near the beginning of the rules, it states when it talks about territories that single province territories like Crete, Rhodes, and up here, Crimea. <laughs> um, that those areas, uh, those territories only count for one point for the, you know, a combined thing of the province and the territory. You don't get extra because you get a point for having a whole non-home territory. So you don't get one for having your own stuff. That's not worth anything. That's just you existing, right? You get it more when you control a whole territory that is not your, not your own, um, and you also get a GOP for controlling a province for each province that you control. So they're, they, they're not letting you double dip for these two. So if I did my count right, if I executed that properly, then the Greeks do have 14 points. They don't get extra to double count these. So something important I need to point out there for that. And if it's not clear otherwise, just to point out, it's important that Melita, Malta, but Melita is part of Sicilies, and uh, the Belares Islands are part of Hispania. Um, it does state that in the rules. So 
that some of these islands are kind of weird. There's a few other, the Aegean islands, which comprise of a couple of spaces, um, are technically part of Greece. So there's some oddball stuff, and because the map does get congested with markers and arrows and lines and everything else, it can be a little tricky. For the most part, you know, you can count your control markers to kind of help with that. And I've tried to make it easier where, like, hey, all of Carthage is controlled by an Eastern player. I'm just going to put the one territory control marker, right? Each control marker has a side that, let's see if I can get it to focus, come on, it says territory on the one side, or it's just a control marker that says province on the other. So it's province or territory control marker. If I put a territory marker on a territory, that means that player for that control marker controls all of it, and I just have to know it's, you know, one, two, three, four provinces. They're going to get the four points, four province points for that. So you, you you get geo, you don't get the point for the territory, but I believe you do get the GOP points for your provinces in your home territory that you control. I might have to double check that, <laughs> but that's what I think is the case. So there, there's a little bit of some nuance there to, to properly understand how this is supposed to all go. Um, and of course, I'm teaching myself, so it, it's like it's entirely possible that I will get something wrong. Um, right, okay, here we go. This is, I think this is the, this is the clarity that the rulebook provides, so just to be clear. You get one GOP for each province that you control, not in a barbarian territory. Barbarian territories are these um, gray areas way out here. Um, those are barbarian areas, which won't really matter as much for us. So you get one GOP for each province that you control that is not in one of those areas. Fair enough. You get one GOP for each territory control that is not your home territory, in addition to the provincial GOPs earned in that territory. So if we get, you know, all of Sicily, you get a point for the Sicilies, um, and then you still count the individual points for each province. So that does make areas like the Sicilies quite valuable for points, because there's a lot of provinces there. Um, no GOP are awarded for controlling your home territory. So by virtue of like Greece, the Greek player has all of Greece, including the Brutium. There's a special rule that makes uh, Brutium part of the Greek home territory in this scenario. Greece holds all of that. They do. They do have that territory for sure. They don't get the extra point for it. But if I read these rules right, um, they do get, the Greek player does get six GOP for this province, this province, this province, this province, this province, and this province. <laughs> but I'm just using one marker to denote that control, um, just so I don't have to put as many markers out on the board. Um, so there, there's a little bit of fiddliness, to be sure, in this game, where you kind of have to really pay attention to the wording uh, of the rules and what means what. I think that's how this game gets its reputation for being complicated. Um, it's not so, so bad. It would probably be even a little easier for me if I had the map shifted closer to me <laughs> where I have this gap on the table uh, as working space, but now I have to kind of like lean over the map and really try to see where I've put things and use my forceps accordingly. Um, okay, so uh, now that we're done talking about how civ points and GOP points work, for, for victory points, or I guess it, just to round it out again, provinces and territories lead to GOP, towns and cities lead to, to civ points or CVPs, and you want to have more than your opponent. And it doesn't matter how much higher you have than your opponent, it just matters that you have more uh, in this particular scenario, at least, when it's one player versus another player. You're really trying to outdo each other. Um, you always want to have the most, I guess, in a given category in a four-player game, but in this two-player game, you, you want more than your opponent. Right now, the East, Persia, and Carthage have the advantage there. Um, okay, now let's maybe talk about what the players are going to try to achieve in turn one. Okay, so how the game's going to work and start off it with is on turn one, uh, the scenario states the play order, which happens to be East activation and then a Greek activation. Up here in the upper right, you just have uh, the lists of activation markers that would start a turn, and when they're used, they just move to the right, off into this box like so. 
You can stack them up. You can handle it any which way you want. Now, that's how the first two activations are going to go. Each player gets one activation, but the East player gets to go first. Once those are played, then we start to pull from the cup. Good old chip pull. And we love that, don't we? Um, the Eastern player has more chips than the Greek player does. Um, at least on this turn, uh, due to some of those special rules, this has to do with the fact that the Eastern player, one of their home, their home territory, which is just called the East, which comprises of this whole sort of like orange area. Um, Egypt controls part of the East, and the Greek player has their Saranacan uh, colony over here. So because it, uh, the Eastern player is missing some of his home territory, uh, they get an extra activation marker. That's basically what that means. Now, it's like a balancing thing. You're sort of being re rewarded for being in a bad situation, I guess. That's one way to look at it. Um, on future turns, the player with the least victory points will be first. So let's just say we go into turn two and Greece is behind. Then the order will be reversed. They will go first, then the Eastern player. They each get one activation in a row, and then we start pulling from the cup again based on whatever activation markers are available for that turn. So it's a pretty straightforward thing. Um, obviously, you can see it gets a little more complicated when there's more players. There's also a rule that a player can't have more than two of their chits in a row. So if we go East activation, Greek activation, we pull from the cup, it's a Greek activation, the next chit has to be an East activation marker, right? So, so sort of something we see similar in some of Ted Racer's Dark Series games where not all of them, mind you, but in some of them, there's a limit to how many of a faction's chits you can pull. That is the case here in this game. Even with two players, uh, max you can have in a row was two of your own activations. Um, so knowing that the Eastern player is going to go first, let's talk a little bit about what they want to do for turn one. Keeping in mind that turn one is like 20 years, 25 years of activity, um, what, what should we try to achieve? Well... What's really nice, and, and this is one of those things, I'm going to sing the praises of uh, uh, Dan uh, uh, Dan Forney, who, who wrote all the C3I scenarios that came out for the game, including the ones that were included uh, in the second printing. So when they printed this game the second time, they included two of the C3I scenarios in the game and provided the counters for them, the, the Diadochi, and I think it's the Magna Gratia scenario. Uh, but what Dan would do when he would write these uh, is he included a history by game turn. Like, this is what happened in those 25 years of the game turn. So you can see kind of like what the historical actors did. And it's like there's a whole couple pages of this, which is really valuable. The turn one, which covers actually 50 years of activity, 570 to 525, or, or not, not 50, geez, I, I can math, guys. I swear, I swear I can 45 years of activity. Um, they talk about Cyrus the Great is going to lead a Persian revolt against media. So technically that's already, that's sort of already occurred because Cyrus is on the board in charge of an army. So um, some of this stuff does, it, you know, just again, the game system can't line up 100% with history. Uh, but once he did that, uh, he invaded the uh, Lydian Empire, Lydian Empire in Asia and took control of it. And eventually worked to subdue Ionia and Pontus. And then, you know, you can kind of read through that, blah, blah, blah. The Greeks were trying to take over Sicily uh, to drive the Phoenicians, meaning the Carthaginians, out of Sicily. Um, and then the Carthaginian king Mal Malchus, Malchus uh, beat back the Greeks in Sicily. Um, and then you had some stuff going on in Alaria and Corsica where... Um, the uh, the Greeks basically got knocked out. So what does that mean in game terms, right? Um, that would see Cyrus the Great, this good elite unit or elite, elite leader over here, taking some guys and he heads into the territories already controlled by Persia and Asia Minor and focuses on taking out Pontus, which is lightly defended up here, as well as Ionia which is the coast here of Asia Minor, where the Greeks do have some light forces that come in here and just claim the rest of Asia Minor territory. It would be kind of one thing to look at doing, right, if we were to play with history. Um, obviously, the Greeks and the Carthaginians are going to be fighting over Sicily. There's a quite large army. 
Um, the leader, Malchus, is a named leader counter that came with C3i. He is a 2-6 elite leader. Um, so he's got a stack of guys. There's some guys in the Labeum. Um, so the Greeks have some armies over here, uh, some units over here. So fighting over Sicily, right? And then, you know, we read that the uh, Greeks got kicked out of Corsica. And so there's some forces nearby that would maybe help facilitate all of that. Not as much action in, mentioned in that little set of paragraphs around Terraconesis or Narbonensis um, with Massilia, but you know the Greeks could technically decide to do something over there. So that gives us a that gives us a roadmap of things that we can look to do. Now we could go and try to take Egypt early. Um, I think the historical notes will show that happens during turn two. Um, but I think it's not a bad idea because I'm just getting used to the game to kind of try to follow history and see how easily I can do all of that stuff there. Um, so maybe that's what we decide to do with our first activation. But just to give you guys a sense of what the game is trying to portray, and then I think it it can do it pretty well. You just have to understand that maybe some, like the whole thing of Cyrus taking over the Median Empire and all that, like that's just not going to happen on the map and the game is situated in a in a situated in such a way that the game can 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 portray a high level view of what's happening and is probably more focused on those last you know twenty five years ish of the time period. So maybe instead of five seventy, they should have called it five fifty. But I don't know. It's just all it's all it's all weird smush historical stuff going on. So we'll see how all that plays out. Um, and what the uh, the Persian player decides to do with his first activation. So we'll talk about that, I guess, more next. Very quickly, before we get too much farther, um, I just want to I just want to cut in one I think important thing that would be easy to overlook. And and I and I was trying to figure out is there a counter for this somewhere that I just don't see, and and maybe there's not. Um, you do have to keep in mind stability. So there's a track uh, up here that tracks your stability. Higher is better, obviously. Um, and as you start to, to lose stability, you know, more bad things will happen to you. There are uh, some things that specifically, and this is on the player aid sheet that I'm showing you, um, that adjust your stability. Some of it's like, you know, if you're losing home territory, that's obviously bad. Um, if you withdraw before combat in your home territory, you know, you chicken out, you lose it. If you draw upon militia, you use it, which is an optional thing. Barbarians are coming to your capital, you lose it. Um, if you start to be the loser each turn for victory points, that will go up and down. Um, and then, you know, there's a few other obvious ones, but this one's really the important one. Having more heavy infantry or legion units more than your CVP, or many times your CVP. Um, and that's basically a case of like, you, it's a limiter on heavy infantry generally for the game. So so having heavy infantry is very strong. They're, they're usually pretty good units. If you have more than your manpower limit, which we talked about earlier, you got to pay more. If you have more than your cities or your towns can sustain, which is what provides your CVPs, if you have more infantry than your cities or towns, then you become less stable. And that's sort of like you're getting too big for your britches kind of thing. You're too heavily militarized, and that is a destabilizing thing. And I don't know if that's maybe one way to, like, I don't know, il illustrate, like, you know, Julius Caesar eventually and the whole thing where um, you had these legions that became more dedicated to leaders and it's just you know there wasn't enough land i i don't know right it just it, it is a balancing factor so that you're not just building tons and tons of heavy infantry more than you can ideally support um now what's interesting about that is that the eastern player across both the persian empire and carthaginian empires don't have any heavy infantry so they don't really have to worry about it the greeks do and i used a extra heavy infantry counter to be my marker for the time being you know, maybe i'll make my own but just just using an extra um let's see if i can get this to focus just using an extra counter nothing special about it just a standard heavy infantry i've put it on the cvp and gop track of the greek player sheet um 
so that uh, you can see over here, so I can keep better track. So as I build heavy infantry or heavy infantry are eliminated, I'll try to remember to move this in relation to the CVP points so we know. And as it stands right now, the Greeks have more CVPs than heavy infantry by one. So they can they can afford to have one more heavy infantry before they need to worry about stability. That stability loss check is during the manpower phase of a turn. So it's sort of like the beginning of next turn. We would um, care about whether or not we've overrun our, our CVP. Now, you can imagine, right, how you fix that is you build more towns or you turn towns into cities and then you get more CVP. That expands your ability to have more heavy infantry. Um, and the, plus you're making more money, which means you can more, have, you're, it's more affordable to have more heavy infantry in general, to build more and pay the maintenance when you go over your manpower limit. So while the game probably slightly emphasizes GOP over CVP for victory points, it is a part of your economic base. You do want to have towns and cities, which brings me to the other important thing. To build a city, you must pay uh, and replace a town and sacrifice a heavy infantry unit. So let's just see as an example, uh, Jerusalem is currently a town right here. It's got some units on it, not a big deal. A town. Now, if we wanted to turn that town into a city, we'd have to pay, uh, if I get the build cost correct, um, here we go. So here's your here's your build and rebuild cost. For a city, you need a full strength town, so it can't be damaged or anything like that. You're going to pay three talents, and you're going to use up a full strength heavy infantry or legion unit, and you get to build the city. You can build a town by spending two talents and a garrison unit. Now, standard units like infantry and heavy infantry can be broken down into garrisons, so you sort of disperse them to create those garrisons. Rather than all that strength in one hex, they can sort of separate and you can garrison the territory. It's sort of how you can gain control of areas quickly. Um, so what we would end up having to do if we wanted to turn Jerusalem into a city would be to get a heavy infantry somehow and then go and improve the town to a city. But because the eastern player, uh, Persia and Carthage, have such a hard time getting heavy infantry, we really cannot rely on upgrading our towns to cities to give us more CVPs. It's going to happen so infrequently, and if we do get heavy infantry, we probably want to use it and fight rather than just turn a town into a city. And so this is going to incentivize the Eastern player to focus on creating towns rather than cities. So we put towns all over the map down over here, or we come down here if we take over a city from the Greeks, then we're going to be in good shape for that reason. But if we're just talking about our, our own self-development of our empires, the, the Eastern player really only has the option to build more, more towns than upgrade towns to cities. So that's something we have to keep in mind. And, and so when I mentioned like the Eastern player is looking at the situation and while we're tied for CVPs, what else can we do? Um, you know, what, what else can be done to affect that game position? Well, um, the reality is uh, the only way that the Eastern player is going to improve their sit points to get those victory points is if they spend some of their actions building towns. So they have to keep that in mind. It's going to be part of it. We could build a town out here in Asia Minor, for instance, uh, in Cappadocia, and sacrifice, you know, turn one of these light infantry into some garrisons and then turn a gar you know, or turn one of these existing garrisons over here into a town. That's something we could look at if we wanted to, um, and it might be worthwhile just to put us put that edge over the Greeks and CVPs, so that the Greeks now have to respond and figure out: Are they going to let you know? Are they going to let the Eastern player get both the GOP victory points and the CVV CVP victory points at the end of the turn, which would put the Greeks way behind, obviously, in overall victory points. So it, it seems like, yes, we want to use the Eastern activations to go on a military campaign, but I think there is a case to be made that it, it wouldn't hurt to spend an action to sort of bump up 
our civilization and, and build some towns in Asia Minor, for instance, where we have a lot of garrisons, a lot of forces that just haven't civilized the, the area yet. Um, and towns are really good because, like, garrisons can be moved. You know, you can move garrisons around, I believe. Um, but when you leave, you know, if you move all these guys out, well, then you don't control Cappadocia anymore. You lose control. Turning it into a town provides something that is stable, that will stay there, has some defensive strength to it um, to maintain control long term. Um, and it's harder to take over than just squashing some garrisons in the way of an army. So there, there's definitely some uh, advantages to doing that. And so I think the Eastern player, when we start looking at their first activation, probably want to do that. Okay. <laughs> one more thing I'm going to point out, just so that no one's confused. If we look at the sequence of play, you can see we normally have income phase, maintenance phase. You can imagine where we get some more talents. We are going to maybe spend some talents on certain things uh, as we need to. We're going to remove some excess stuff that may be present. We're going to get new leaders, and then we would do the manpower phase, and that's sort of when we do a check of our heavy infantry and, and are potentially raising additional units. <clears throat> so ordinarily, you would have the ability to raise units during the sort of pre-phase. Uh, when you look at the activation phase, um, there's... Uh, because we're playing an advanced game, uh, we're going to ignore the event segment. Um, there's a payment segment, so when you have an activation, you know, for each activation you pull, that's going to get an F phase, uh, or an F um, uh, uh, an F block here. So you're going to pay a talent for each activation, so you got to have money in the bank to pay for your activations. Then we're going to draw a card, an event card, um, we'll show that on camera as we go through, and then you actually do the operation, and then you pull a new marker. The scenario that we're playing starts on the F phase in the third step. So play begins with the Eastern activation marker where they're just going to do the operations. They don't need to pay, and we're not going to draw a card. So we're just going to get right into, uh, you know, we're not going to call a meeting. We don't need to do that. So our options with our operation segment are going to be to do a recruitment action, which is get more units, which I don't think we need to do that. We have plenty of units on the board as the Eastern player. So it's really going to leave us with the expansion, which this includes both building towns and cities and moving and uh, attacking with armies. So it's all collected under expansion. And we get two minor moves and two major moves in any order that we want. So that is what we're going to be looking to do when we're done with all of our active act activations. Then we would look at attrition and isolation. We do the victory point calculations, and then we figure out who will go first in turn two, and we play all the way through, right? Um, now there are four, you know, for, for this turn, there will be a total of uh, three Greek activations and four uh, Eastern activations. So there's, out of what's left in the cup, just to be clear on what we have in here, um, two Greek markers after the first one, and then three more Eastern after the first one. So that's where we're going to find out. Um, so here's the thing. I think with as much introduction talk as we just had, sort of laying out the situation, um, I'm going to split this into two different videos. Uh, so this video will obviously be... I think the video as published will be turn one, part one, and then we'll do a part two or we'll actually play through. This is almost a combination of introduction, setup, and turn one, because we had to talk around the context of turn one, but the actual play we'll, we'll do in the next video. So sorry, I, I, sorry guys, I, I kind of want to make these videos not as long if I can help it, and it seems like a really logical stopping point right here. Um, for us to talk about the rest of these game mechanics that really influence our decision making, all the historical context around these decisions, and all the other housekeeping stuff, we're, we're right at the point where we can start, you know, actually playing the game. Uh, but I feel like a pause here is warranted so that the next video is chock full. So, um, yeah, I think it'll do it for this video. Then, hopefully, not too terribly long for you guys, and we'll get right into the thick of things in the next video. So, thanks for watching, guys. Take care. Keep gaming.